name is Meredith Doig. Um, I've been a, a rationalist. I'm now president of the Rationalist Society. I've been with the Rationalist Society for about five years. And originally, I joined the Rationalists because um, I became aware of the sort of creeping evangelistic fervour with which religious fundamentalists in this country were influencing public policy. And whilst I'm not against uh, religion per se, I mean, what people believe in the privacy of their own minds is up to them. I don't understand why people believe in a God, but if they want to do that, that's fine, that's up to them. But I do object when uh, religionists use the public institutions like uh, schools to impose their views uh, on young people, on others. And so I think it's important, critically important, that we protect and fight for uh, our secular society and our secular education system. So that's uh, how I got involved in, in rationalism. Yes, I think it probably is possible to create general intelligence, the GI factor, um, artificially. But that's not all a human being is. Humans are more than just a general intelligence factor. General intelligence factor to me is more associated with um, a logic, and clearly a machine can be developed that, that demonstrates logic, but beyond that, um, rationality. And I think it's probably clear that a machine could be developed that demonstrates rationality, but human beings are more than rationality as well. Human beings have emotions and demonstrate qualities such as respect or love. How do you build that into a machine? That's where I think it's really going to struggle to replicate a, the full capacities of a human being. Yeah, it's a good question, and I think this is what Dan Dennett is on about. I haven't read all his stuff, but I, I gather this is what he's on about. He's saying, uh, because we are basically atoms, and atoms interact with one another in certain ways, and neur neuronal pathways interact, and we, we can, we're moving towards understanding how those neuronal pathways um, behave, then it's not inconceivable that at some stage in the future we can replicate um, uh, synapses and neuronal pathways and so on and so forth. Therefore, by extrapolation, why could we not um, assume that we can eventually replicate a, a human being? And I suppose I would say, yep, probably we could. I think I'd agree with Dennett in that way. But it still seems just beyond what is probable. And I try to think why is it that there is this um, impediment to simply accepting that the extrapolation will be true? Well, for two reasons. One, or one, one explanation is we all tend to stick with what is familiar and just trying to get your head around the idea that a human being could totally replicate, uh, sorry, a, a machine could totally replicate a human being. That's a real challenge to the imagination. That's really going into the <laughs> out of your comfort zone. So that's one thing. But the other thing is, um, being a mathematician by training many years ago myself, I'm perfectly comfortable with the idea that there are some things that the human brain um, cannot imagine. For example, we can't imagine a physical fifth dimension 
or sixth dimension and so on. And I don't see that that's a problem. You can represent a fifth and a sixth and so on dimensions mathematically, but having the human brain um, imagine what those might look like, look like, um, is beyond our, our imagination. So I don't see that that's a problem. I'm perfectly comfortable that there are some things which are unimaginable. So, yeah, it's having a, a machine that is totally the same as a human being is sort of unimaginable, but that's okay. I'm perfectly comfortable with that. For all I know, you might be a machine. You speak and look and act as if you're a human being. Maybe you are a machine and I don't know it. Gosh, I hope not, because they're in it for the money. <clears throat> it's commercial business. I think that'd be a bit scary. But I don't think that they're pursuing AI uh, in the terms that we've been talking about. I think they're probably pursuing very sophisticated um, expert systems. And that's really just decision making. Data in, system, treatment, data out. I don't think that's what we're talking about here. Well, th this I think goes back to what I was saying before about the, the value and the, the desirability, well, the, the, the um, necessity for really good education. Because there is a, um, a tendency, I think, for human beings to react to something, particularly if it feels threatening in any way in an emotional way, to let the amygdala um, dominate over the prefrontal cortex. Um, the idea, of, and, and it's very easy, therefore, to uh, respond with you, you're either with us or, or you're against us, it's black or white, it, to simplify and simply have that emotional reaction to something. On the other hand, almost all uh, human dilemmas are multifaceted and therefore to really understand these properly you need to think about probabilities you need to think about um, how one outcome the degree to which one outcome may occur as opposed to another outcome that involves probability what's the likelihood that outcome A versus outcome B versus outcome C, D, E, F, G, etc, etc. So understanding probability and thinking in terms of likelihoods is really, really important as opposed to simply that knee-jerk emotional reaction to I agree or I don't agree. I think this is really one of the biggest challenges. Um, human beings clearly are influenced by emotion and there's differing views as to whether or not this is a good thing or a bad thing. I mean clearly it's a good thing in certain circumstances. My own view is that it's a bad thing in other circumstances and in particular it's a bad thing when you're dealing with politics or you're dealing with well politics on a big scale or politics on a on a small interpersonal scale. Um, allowing emotional reactions to drown out some sort of um, rational response to moral dilemmas I think is very dangerous. It can be um, manipulated by people who are very clever with rhetoric. We know examples of when that's happened in the past. It's happened beneficially as well as detrimentally. I mean, Martin Luther King was a master rhetorician, a master orator, and he used his powers of oratory for good effect and for good outcomes. But he was just as powerful a uh, an orator as Hitler was, and who used his powers for very different um, means. So, I think that uh, 
It's really important that we develop a culture which values rationality and understands that there is a place for emotionality, but understands what that place is.